Okay, so Claire, um, I really want to start with your story just because it's so interesting um, from being a professional cellist to being a dementia researcher. And um, just briefly, if you can talk a little bit about not the, the material facts of how you made that change, but um, what does it feel like to move from being a professional researcher to being a gerontologist? So that's a good question. I um, started out most of my life up through my 40s and 50s have been being a professional cellist. I've played with lots of big orchestras and chamber groups. And during all of that time, I also had the privilege and honor of playing the cello for friends and family in their homes, for um, playing also while sadly some of my friends' parents were getting very old and dying. I also took care of a person with AIDS and played for him very near the time he died and a man who was 102 um, as he was dying. And I knew that, I was, that it was important that I was playing and the cello is such a, a, a very humanistic sounding instrument and very much like the voice. And I knew I was doing something important but I didn't feel I knew what I was doing. So I went and got training in the United States to become a music practitioner and what that meant was I got trained to, to about the nuances of playing music for people nearing the end of life, specifically. So that really enabled me through improvisation, through learning about different kinds of music to play, different tempos of music, um, to feel more comfortable with that. So I started playing um, and being hired in the States to play in hospice settings when people wanted music to be played. And when I moved to Scotland in 2007, there was nothing like that here, sadly. When I started, I had also been a researcher in the States and that kind of became a natural place for me to go. I started learning about enhanced palliative care at the University of Stirling. I took a master's where I wrote essays and learned about and really started becoming academically thinking towards what did this mean? What was the music really doing for people? Um, nearing the end of life. Right. That was my right. focus nearing the end of life, not so much dementia. When I started a doctorate, I got a studentship from Sterling University, that became, then the focus became on not only people nearing the end of life, but people who had dementia. Yeah. And my interest has always been about people who are not easily reached, people who are very frail, either cognitively and or physically, who are not going to benefit from kind of general music in a group setting. Yeah. And what it's done for me is it's made me, I find now when I teach um, courses for undergrads on music therapies and tell them about different things, musicians often, especially when they're younger, when I was younger, we don't think of it that way. We think of it as, oh, we're going and we're performing. But really, we're communicators, and all performers are communicators, but it's easy to forget that and get egotistical about, oh, I'm, how did everybody like it? How was it? Am I, you know? What this brings me back to is a very bare roots kind of thing where it's not about, did I play it perfectly? I'm playing, my body lies over the ocean. I'm not playing some very exquisite classical piece. And it's reaching somebody just as deeply as that exquisite piece might for somebody. And it means that as somebody, as D Tia Donora says, all music is good if it does good, which I love that quote because it's about, I've learned that I have a mandate, I feel, from the teaching I've had as a, with my cello teachers who were all, by the way, old women, and that was part of the thing for me that drew me in. Yeah. But I have a mandate to continue not only that oral history of teaching, but also of communicating, giving the music to other people. And this is a way of bringing music to people who would not normally have access to it, who are often told, oh, that person's past that they won't benefit from hearing. Right, right. Well, that's a really good segue into my next question. You talked about communication, and, um, and you've mentioned Haven mm. as the title of this, this talk. And if you were to imagine Haven as a space, mm. so it includes you, it includes 
the person or people you're playing for. It includes the environment. It includes everything. Mm. So if you were to imagine that space of haven, what kind of communication happens within that haven? Mm, yes, and you know, you go to music festivals, I know, um, and I've played at music festivals, and it, this is part of that forgetting that I think happened a bit with me as a performer, but is certainly part of my performing now, is that whenever we play music as a performer, for one thing, you are creating a space, um, and to be very aware of that, and what happens is that music can be maybe more than anything else, especially in that latter stage of life, a, a thing, a vehicle for creating both a sonic environment. So you can't always change the environment of a care home, unfortunately, you can't, or a hospital certainly, especially acute care or something like that. Bells are going off, things are happening. It's very sterile environment, but you can bring music to it and change the the environment sonically and you can transport the people that are within that circle if you will which is often very intimate in the work I'm doing maybe two three people at the most you can the musician and the music have the possibility of through either playing familiar music that may transport a listener back in time to a time a memory good or bad but certainly out of the present and you can do that yourself turn on the radio you're going to have that experience no doubt in a while if you turn on a popular music station. Um, or it can also transport somebody, it may not even be a familiar piece of music, it may just be something that touches somebody because music can reach anybody as long as there's any hearing available and it can be very little the amount of hearing actually. As long as they can hear the music and they're receptive, which will happen over a period of a little bit of time of playing, music, familiar music or unfamiliar music can touch somebody and take, transport that person's reality somewhere else. And if you're sharing it with someone, there can be a real intimacy that happens with this shared experience of either shared memories that may come up, if they know each other and the music does that, right. or, or sharing just the wonder of some, maybe it's the first time they've shared music together or shared listening to the cello, um, feeling it a very special experience. It depends on how the two people in mind or the people listening receive it, of course, that's a big issue. It's about the receptivity. But it's also about watching the nonverbal cues and going with that, playing genres that people like, playing Scottish music in the case of where I was doing my study, if that's what they like. If they don't like Scottish music, don't play it. Stop a piece immediately, go on to something else. Maybe it's something completely new that they've just heard on the radio five minutes ago. You, it, it, and with dementia, it can make it so that, somebody put this very beautifully recently, Sally Magnuson actually, that the words when somebody who has dementia has not been able to speak possibly for a long time, sometimes that familiar piece, my body lies over the ocean, they can suddenly sing that and something happens in the brain where they are able to say, sing words in the order, in the correct order for the right. first time in ages and they've been trying to say sentences and can't and suddenly there must be such a great feeling of being able to sing a line in the correct order of words, something as simple as that. Um, so there's a great amount of release that can happen and also a very lovely kind of, I witnessed, interaction and interchange, both the music communicating and the musician communicating non-verbally with the listeners, but also the music itself um, fostering communication. And that becomes yeah. part of the yeah. haven. So it becomes this very, its haven is really about a safe place where people are included, they're part of something, they're involved, it's transporting them from their present reality to somewhere else and refurbishing it with whatever that music is at the time, if that makes sense. Oh, it makes, it's lovely. It's really, really lovely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very so much, Naomi, much. for doing this. Thank yeah. you very much.